Great, it's good to see you uh, this morning. I want to, of course, acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory of the Lekongan speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. And I want to start um, this availability today by advising uh, the media and the public that the new government caucus and cabinet will be sworn in next week. The caucus on Tuesday, November 24th and the cabinet on Thursday, November 26th. Like so many other events uh, and celebrations and ceremonies over the past eight months, this will be different from any other swearing in. It will be done virtually. We will see, in my case, uh, 23 new members of the legislature taking their seats virtually for the first time. We've been working with the clerk of the legislature and all of the facility staff here to make sure that we can do this in a way that, of course, is safe for the individuals involved and means uh, that we will have uh, our government sworn in and ready to go for the short session that we're announcing uh, that will begin on December 7th with a brief throne speech talking about, of course, the fundamental issues of how do we as a community, how do we as a province address the challenges of COVID-19. How do we stay safe? How do we take care of each other? How do we keep our economy going? How do we keep our schools in place in a safe manner so that our kids can get the education that they need and we can reduce anxiety right across the province? These are very challenging times. Uh, this is a bit of an understatement for all of you. I understand that. But we can't lose our resolve. We cannot now, after eight and a half, nine months of working together to flatten the curve to protect each other and our communities, we cannot now give up on that cause. Uh, of course, I was briefed again today by Dr. Henry and Minister Dix and their team. Uh, they'll have more to say tomorrow at their traditional briefing. Uh, but suffice it to say that the regional orders that were brought in on November 9th uh, need to be take hold. They need to be able to take hold. That means we need to ensure that the clusters we're seeing as caseloads go up from social gatherings are reduced as much as possible. We need to revise operating plans and businesses, and we're doing that through WorkSafe BC. Public health officials are also working uh, overtime and have been for months and months and months to ensure that we have in place the appropriate orders to protect each other and to keep our economy and our province moving forward. When it comes to travel, non-essential travel is prohibited in British Columbia, and it will remain that way for the next two weeks at least. I'm going to reach out to the Prime Minister. We have been working collaboratively for months now. I think the last conference call, uh, the Prime Minister said it was the 27th meeting uh, that Premiers and the federal government have had over the past 10 months, which of course is unprecedented. But I want to say today that we need a pan-Canadian approach to travel. We need to make sure that people in Coquitlam are living under the same rules as people in Chicoutimi. We need to make sure that those who want to come to British Columbia must only do so if it is essential for their business or their well-being. Beyond that, we need to stay in our tight social circles. This is critically important at this point in the mandate and this point in the, in the pandemic, I should say. We are so close. Uh, vaccine breakthroughs are very encouraging. And when the vaccines are ready, British Columbia will be ready. But we're not there yet. We can see the finish line. We can see some hope at the end of what has been a very, very difficult tunnel. But we cannot lose our resolve. Now we have to redouble our efforts to protect each other and our province going forward. Uh, I know that Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will have more to say about that tomorrow. I'll leave it to them to do so, and I'll invite any questions you may have. Reminder to reporters, please press star one to enter the queue. You'll be allowed one question and one follow-up today. And our first question is from Richard Zisman, Global News. Hello. Premier, I'm not sure you've seen this yet, considering you've been in briefings and meetings, but uh, some of the mayors uh, from Fraser Health, uh, Surrey, Delta, the two Langleys and White Rock, have sent you another letter asking for regional data around COVID. Is this something that you've brought up in your briefings with Dr. Henry and Adrian Dix? Is it something being considered, uh, considering that the mayors believe that they need the municipal data around the spread of the virus in order to dole out their resources, their enforcement, and better manage the pandemic? Well, thank you for the question. And my, and my message to the mayors is the same as my message to the citizens in Fraser Health. You need to amend your behavior. You need to reduce your social gatherings. You need to focus on staying distant from people you don't know and if you can't do so, you must wear a mask. You should wear a mask. 
I wear a mask when I'm engaging with people, you should do the same thing. Dr. Henry will have more to say on that tomorrow, but suffice it to say that the data is fairly clear. COVID is everywhere in British Columbia. It is acute right now in Fraser Health. The numbers are there are unacceptably high and have been for the past two and a half weeks. So I say to the mayors and I say to the people of Fraser Health, we need to work together to amend our behavior, to reduce the clusters. And these clusters are coming from social gatherings. They're not coming uh, from workplaces. Uh, predominantly, if, the, if there's an outbreak in a workplace, it's because of a social gathering that led to an employee bringing uh, the virus into that workplace. Uh, so we need to make sure we're amending our behavior. Together, collectively, we can get through this. Uh, I welcome uh, interventions and support from uh, local government leaders and, and we will be reaching out to them to ensure that they have all of the information they need to spread the message in their community. COVID is everywhere, it's everywhere. And we need to adopt our adapt our behaviors to that simple truth. It doesn't matter if you're in Delta or if you're in Langley or if you're in Chilliwack, COVID is in the community. So you need to act accordingly. Richard, do you have a follow up? In Toronto, they report data uh, by neighborhood. In other provinces, they report data that's much more specific than in British Columbia. What are we hiding here that the other provinces believe is important information to get to the public? Well, I, 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 I uh, reject the, the, the construction of the question, Richard. Uh, we're not hiding anything. We have been uh, as transparent as any jurisdiction in North America uh, on a daily basis for months giving appropriate information to the public so they have an understanding of the risks of COVID-19 in British Columbia. Uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Henry for her uh, rationale about how we distribute this information. But first and foremost, we do not want to stigmatize individuals. We do not want to stigmatize communities or neighborhoods. We want everyone to understand that we are all at risk, regardless of who we are, where we come from, what our economic status is, we are all at risk and we have to act accordingly. Our next question is from Rob Shaw, Vancouver Sun. Uh, hi, Premier. Just Could you expand on what you would like from the Prime Minister on this collaborative approach to travel? Or, uh, do you want to see a federal restriction on travel between provinces so that that's not something the, the, the province can enforce? Or what is it specifically that you want to see from him there? Well, I, th I think it, it's a question of leadership, and I, I'm not suggesting that there hasn't been su sufficient leadership at the federal level on a range of issues. And I'm not requesting the federal government to impose anything on any other jurisdiction in Canada. I'm asking the federal government to work with us and other provinces to get the message out that if you do not have to travel between uh, jurisdictions, you shouldn't do so. Uh, so a, a pan-Canadian approach, when I say that, that means the, exactly what, what uh, I, I'm suggesting. That is that uh, the people of Quebec and Ontario and Manitoba need to know that they should stay in Quebec, Ontario and Manitoba until we get to a place where we can start distributing a vaccine across the country. So uh, I'm encouraging the Prime Minister to take this opportunity uh, to work with all of us, and I'm confident that he will, to say broadly to all Canadians, uh, stay where you live, reduce your social interactions, uh, do only those things that are essential to you and your family and your business and your, and your employment. And other than that, stay tight, stay focused on bending that curve. We have uh, a, a significant two weeks ahead of us uh, as we look at the second uh, component of the regional orders that were put in place on November 9th. And as I say, Dr. Henry will have more to say on, uh, on orders tomorrow, uh, but we all need to keep in mind that this is not this is not a penalty. This is not uh, uh, people wagging their finger at you. This is solid advice that will keep you and your family and your loved ones safe. And that's uh, the reason we've been doing this for the past nine months, not to, uh, to uh, stigmatize people, not to say that this area is less safe than another area. It's to try and put in place programs and, and a regime that will protect people. And that's been our objective from the beginning. And that continues to be our objective right through the winter and into the spring when we hope that uh, vaccines will be rolling out in sufficient amounts that British Columbians can return to some semblance of normal. Rob, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, please. Thanks. Can you just um, outline for us what you need to accomplish in this brief legislature session uh, and give us an update on the status of those $1,000 um, COVID relief checks that you've been hoping to get out before Christmas? Does it look like you're going to be able to do that if you can pass the spending legislation and 
can you shed any light on on how that would be done? I know a bunch of us get emails from people asking, am I going to have to sign up for this? Do I have to register? Is like the homeowner grant? What is the mechanism to get this money if you can get it out the door? Well, we're still working on some of the details, Rob, but I can give you a pretty comprehensive answer. We need to appropriate, appropriate the resources to distribute the money. Uh, we have done that through the summer, as you will remember, uh, virtually. Uh, we have uh, Mike Farnworth, who uh, I guess I'm uh, doing an advance notice of the current House leader and likely to be the future House leader, has been in contact with the uh, two opposition parties, uh, preparing them for a December 7th return of the legislature. Uh, we will do that largely virtually, but uh, there are opposition members on the island, there are uh, government members on the island, so we will have a contingent of people in the legislature doing the essential business of the people. Uh, we need to appropriate the resources, and then it's up to the Ministry of Finance to distribute those based on the criteria that were laid out during the campaign and will, of course, be laid out in any legislation that we bring forward. Uh, we believe that we have sufficient data because of the work we did on the worker benefits uh, back in the first phase of, uh, of the recovery plan back in uh, March, April and May, as well as uh, uh, income uh, tax information that's held by the Ministry of Finance so that we can determine uh, what income levels uh, would require that, uh, that refund or that uh, recovery benefits and then we'll distribute those dollars uh, by direct deposit is the intention and much of that information is already held by government for the purposes of distributing resources. So uh, we, we're pretty confident that should we get through the legislative session uh, quickly, uh, in a week or so, uh, we'll be able to get those uh, deposits done uh, shortly thereafter. And we're targeting Christmas, of course, uh, but I think at this extraordinary time, I, you'll probably agree with me, Rob, I think British Columbians will just be happy to have uh, access to a uh, thousand bucks for their family or 500 bucks for individuals, whether it comes on December 24th or it comes on the 5th of January. Our next question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Uh, Premier, other provinces have implemented some clear new restrictions this week um, beyond lobbying the federal government for uh, can a pan-Canadian approach on travel. Uh, what additional measures are being considered in BC? You know, what kind of options is your office discussing with the provincial health officer, and what would it take to implement them? Well, again, we are in regular uh, briefings with uh, public health and uh, Minister Dix. Uh, we talk, uh, Minister Dix and I talk daily. Uh, uh, Dr. Henry and I are, are in regular contact. She brings forward the, uh, uh, the, the science, the evidence. Uh, we deliberate and we proceed. Uh, we had one of those briefings today and she'll be laying out the details of that tomorrow. But uh, I think it's not uh, a surprise to foreshadow that uh, there are a whole host of initiatives that are already underway. Uh, and we want to amend our, our operating plans based on new evidence. And, and that's why we have troubleshooters uh, going into the K-12 system. Uh, that was a collaborative effort through uh, the BC Teachers Federation, the Labour Board and government to make sure that we can respond rapidly to changing circumstances in our classrooms. Uh, we have uh, demonstrated that uh, we can operate our K-12 system safely. There are isolated uh, outbreaks, but again, we have to put all of this in context. We are, we are living with COVID-19 in our communities, and, and uh, the evidence is fairly clear that children are not transmitters of COVID, and so adults uh, working within the, the K-12 system are, are bringing the virus into the classrooms and bring, or into the schools, and, and that's led to outbreaks in, in pockets of British Columbia, and we want to stamp that out. We want to work together uh, with trustees, with administrators and others to stamp that out. Dr. Henry will have more to say about the public health approach to that, but I believe that all of the stakeholders working together is, is what we need to see. Parents want their kids in classrooms to the greatest extent possible. We want to make sure we do that safely. And those are the types of amendments that uh, we talk about so when we have our briefings. Uh, with respect to uh, masks, we have been saying for months, if you cannot physically distance, wear a mask. There are businesses and other enterprises who have mandates uh, for masks in their establishments. And uh, Don, Dr. Henry will be talking about those issues again tomorrow. So what we've been doing, and I think it's been consistent uh, over the months, is as new information comes available, as the science dictates, we will pivot and amend uh, our plans. And that is uh, appropriate. And I think the British Columbians expect that. Uh, and uh, we're doing our, our level best to meet the expectations of keeping people safe, keeping our economy open, 
and, and not using uh, uh, restrictions in a heavy-handed way, but using restrictions in a way that are protecting uh, public health and protecting uh, our loved ones. And uh, again, I want to reinforce uh, the news around vaccines is very encouraging, but we're not there yet. It's November, and I think in the first quarter of 2021, we'll see uh, further uh, evidence of, uh, to, to support the implementation and distribution of vaccines, but we are not there yet. And I think we should take hope from that, but we also need to be reminded that our behavior and how we interact with each other has to be consistent with getting to that finish line. And that means reducing our, our social activities, our social gatherings to the people that we know, uh, going to work, uh, certainly uh, conducting our essential business every day, but doing it in a way that, that keeps us safe. And that, in my world, means wearing a mask. Tanya, do you have a follow-up? Okay, we'll move on to Bender Sajjan. Are you there, Bender? Travel. Oh. I am. Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead. Hello, okay. Uh, Premier, just wanted to ask you more about travel with NBC. Um, you're talking about, you know, non-essential travel uh, should be ruled out right now, but, you know, regionally, have you, are you open to the idea of having a ban on travel to and from certain regions, perhaps Vancouver Island or places um, in the north or interior? Well, there, are, there is uh, essential travel that must happen. We need to move goods and services around British Columbia to keep our economy going, to keep our uh, shelves stocked with food and other essential provisions uh, to get through what will be a cold and, and uh, long winter for all of us. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we put in uh, restrictions uh, beyond saying the obvious, that if you don't need to travel, don't travel. This is not the time to go storm watching on the west coast of Vancouver Island. This is not the time uh, to, to plan for a large gathering of friends uh, over the Christmas holiday. We need to focus on getting through the winter, getting through this second wave, which has proven to be significantly challenging, again, not just in British Columbia, but the evidence is very clear. This is a, a global challenge and we are not immune to that and we need to act appropriately. And I, I'm confident British Columbians get that. We did so well in March, April and May. And as the summer came, uh, our successes perhaps uh, led us to believe that we were gonna be able to continue this uh, right through to the development of new therapies and new vaccines. We are not there yet. We need to remind ourselves of the success we had when we thought about each other uh, and thought about our community and thought about our loved ones. And that's where we need to be. So my direction and the direction of public health is if you're not uh, required to travel, you should not travel. Do you have a follow-up, Binder? Yes, um, I just wanted to ask you about long-term care homes. There are some health officials who are suggesting that we need more, we need preventative testing um, at care homes to save lives. Um, staff more often and residents as well. Um, and not just those who show symptoms. Just wondering what your thoughts are on that, uh, given the issues, issues that have happened at care homes. Yeah, this, these are very uh, important issues. Uh, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix are focused on them every day. Uh, and I know uh, Adrian particularly has uh, put a lot of emphasis on how we can uh, re reassess how our long-term care facilities have operated in British Columbia over the past uh, uh, 16 years or so, and we've been making amendments to operating procedures uh, in terms of single sites, in terms of a whole host of uh, human resource issues, as well as trying to find ways that we can visit our loved ones in long-term care in a safe manner. We have a lot of work to do there, and it's every day uh, we struggle with these issues, but uh, the testing regime, again, is not something that's directed from the Premier's office. That's developed through public health uh, with input from the Ministry of Health and uh, the Minister and uh, Bonnie work on those issues. Uh, they implement uh, the plans after deliberation and discussion with me and others. And I'm confident that the testing uh, pro pro practices that we have in British Columbia are, are in place to protect people, workers and uh, seniors that when it comes to long-term care. And we're gonna continue to do our best to make sure that we're testing everyone who needs testing to protect uh, individuals and communities. Our next question is from Rob Buff on CTV Vancouver Island. Oh, hi, good morning, Premier. I'm hoping to get your thoughts on the idea of a requirement that people coming to Vancouver Island self-isolate or quarantine for 14 days if they're not coming here for essential travel. And it's in the context of 
um, the island's top doctor, Dr. Stanwick, as you know, encouraging or suggesting that that might be a good thing in light of how effective something similar has been in the Maritimes. What are your thoughts on a 14-day quarantine if you come to the island for non-essential travel? Yeah, I, I responded to that uh, yesterday uh, when the question came to me. I talked with Dr. Henry about it today. Of course, uh, Dr. Stanwick is a, a, the public health officer here on Vancouver Island, and he's put this forward. Uh, he and his colleagues, Dr. Henry and others across the province, are, are looking at that, uh, and I'll await a final determination uh, from public health on how to proceed. Uh, my, my view is that, uh, that a quarantine on Vancouver Island uh, may not be the best way forward, but I, what I do know is that people on, British, uh, on Vancouver Island are, are quite proud of the low uh, case rate up until the past couple of weeks. And, uh, and I know that British Columbians and, and Vancouver Islanders want to get that curve bent. Uh, but I don't know that uh, Dr. Stanwick's suggestion, uh, we didn't get into a lot of detail with, it, with Dr. Henry this morning, but I'll leave it to her and, and he to figure out what they believe is the best way forward. Non-essential travel uh, should not be happening in British Columbia. Do you have a follow-up, Rob? I do, and it relates to uh, travel uh, between the island and the mainland. I'm wondering what your thoughts might be on revisiting, um, engaging Transport Canada on the idea that folks who are required to travel on the ferries for essential work or travel be allowed to stay in their, their vehicles on enclosed car decks. I know Transport Canada told our newsroom yesterday that you know they continue to engage with the province of BC on this issue. Would you consider pushing them to allow that in light of all these you know, increase in numbers that we're seeing? Yeah, well, uh, th those are, there's a couple of things to unpack there. Uh, firstly, we want uh, only essential travel, so that uh, uh, suggests that there'll be less ferry traffic uh, as a result of that. But I, I fully agree that uh, uh, Transport Canada was premature in, uh, in taking away the exemption that BC Ferry sought and was granted uh, during the, the, the middle of the pandemic. We are not out of the woods yet, and, and I will when I talk to the Prime Minister about a pan-Canadian approach to uh, travel within Canada. We'll talk again about uh, Transport Canada's uh, edict here. Uh, I believe that uh, BC Ferries can uh, come up with strategies to keep people safe. That would mean having more people, uh, BC Ferries employees, on the car deck in the event that there is a requirement to evacuate. I think there are ways to get through this that will keep the public safe. We've talked to BC Ferries about that. We've talked to Transport Canada about that, and, and I'll continue to push this. But uh, again, uh, we have jurisdictional differences in Canada. That's what our federation is all about. Uh, I don't have to like them, but I should acknowledge them. And, and uh, it's federal uh, jurisdiction when it comes to uh, Transport Canada's rules on BC ferries. Uh, an exemption was granted uh, for months in the summer. Why an exemption wouldn't be granted now as we see a second wave building in British Columbia is a mystery to me. And I will uh, present that mystery to the Prime Minister uh, when I talk to him later this week. Our next question is from Shristi Gangda, CKNW. Hi, Premier. Thank you for taking my question. Um, earlier this year, you wrote to the BC Human Rights Commissioner asking for guidance on the collection of disaggregated data. Her office wrote back to you um, saying that data is critical to understanding and identifying inequalities in Canada and combating the impact of the pandemic. Earlier this month, though, so, uh, Dr. Henry said we're still not collecting that data and it's effectively because of time constraints. Is that acceptable when so many other jurisdictions have been collecting and releasing that data for months? And will you commit to providing public health the resources needed to collect that data? Well, thank you for the question. And uh, I know that, uh, that this is an issue that I feel strongly about, as does my, uh, my caucus. Uh, we will be bringing forward legislation, anti-racism legislation, as we committed to during the election campaign, that will capture some of these issues. Uh, it's going to become part and parcel of how we operate going forward. Uh, I want to say, though, that uh, Dr. Henry and public health are overwhelmed, uh, and I don't mean that in a way of uh, can't keep pace, but there's a whole lot of work going on right now, and the collection of that data and the distribution of it is not as timely as the commissioner and others would want to see, but the commitment is absolutely genuine, and we're going to meet that commitment over time uh, as resources uh, dictate. Uh, but it's not just simply a matter of uh, directing dollars. We are focused right now on hiring contact tracers. We are already heading towards 1,000 contact tracers, more to come. We're hiring more uh, public health uh, uh, officials to help us uh, uh, guide British Columbians through the challenges that we face. 
Uh, that's not to diminish the importance of the race-based data collection and distribution, but we have to prioritize, as all people do uh, during a crisis, to make where are we going to put our resources to best effect to protect people. Uh, so that's not a, a, a walk back if, uh, if it would be characterized as that. It's only a matter of when's the appropriate time to implement this policy, and we're going to continue to work on it. Trish, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I do, um, and I understand the uh, the constraints of resources. Um, but what we've seen in other jurisdictions is that the the race based impacts are having direct effects on people's lives and are sometimes killing people. Is that not uh, enough of a priority at the moment to to kind of uh, to put that into uh, effect straight away? I guess. Uh, I, well, I, again, I, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I, I don't think that uh, public health officials would uh, uh, slow down on initiatives that would save people's lives. Uh, so uh, we are working as, as best we can uh, to meet the challenges uh, of public health, to meet the challenges of uh, maintaining uh, in a safe manner our economic activity and, and a host of other uh, interactions that British Columbians want to continue to have as we come through uh, this second wave and into that period of uh, hope that uh, a vaccine brings us into the into the spring. Uh, but uh, again, I, I, I think we're doing the best we can and uh, I've made it clear the direction the government is going and we're going to get there. The challenge is uh, we have uh, uh, to operate virtually, which is a challenge. We are have to act and and walk the walk. We can't just talk the talk about inter uh, our ability to get together and to to expedite decision making processes and and I'm confident that Dr. Henry and her team are working as fast as they can to implement these programs. We have Tanya Fletcher back for some te technical difficulties with her earlier question. She's back for one more. Thank you so much. Um, Premier, you're urging non-essential travel around BC. How might this be enforced? And for out-of-province travelers, are you suggesting there be some kind of mechanism to ensure they quarantine for 14 days if they do come here? Well, again, these are issues that we've been working with uh, interprovincially for months now. Uh, we have free mobility in Canada. It's part of our citizenship. If you live in British Columbia, you're able to freely travel to other parts of the country. Uh, in the Maritimes, they brought in a bubble, a maritime bubble, uh, earlier in the pandemic. It proved successful for them at that moment. And, and uh, we don't have the ability to do that. We have large borders. We're focused on obviously our international borders and uh, with cases uh, spiking in Washington state, uh, we're grateful for that. There's cases spiking in Alaska as well. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have an approach to uh, travel that is not co inconsistent with Canadian citizenship, but recognizes if we have all provincial leaders and the federal government speaking with one voice, telling people to stay home, we can work on the enforcement mechanisms and, and uh, how we would use quarantines possibly uh, going forward. But there are a lot of people that live in British Columbia, work in Alberta, live in Alberta, work in British Columbia. And we've seen uh, transmission as a result of that. Uh, so, you know, th Dr. Henry and the health officials are very much aware of that. And, and this information is uh, available to the federal government. It's available to other uh, provincial leaders. And we're working uh, always, week after week after week, trying to find ways to uh, coordinate our, our activities and our directions to protect Canadians, and we'll continue to do that. We only have time for one more today. We're going to end with Justine Hunter. Thank you. Um, uh, Premier, I'm wondering if you can, from your briefing today, give us an idea of what your understanding is of why the cases are surging in, in Fraser Health and Surrey in particular. Well, uh, as I understand it, uh, social gatherings, uh, that's where the transmissions are happening. Uh, people are gathering in large numbers, uh, larger numbers than have been directed. Uh, that's leading to transmission. Then it goes from those gatherings into uh, households, into businesses, uh, and into other activities. So uh, uh, we've seen, for example, in the hospitality sector, restaurants uh, and restaurant operators have gone to great pains and significant cost uh, to put in place operating plans to protect their, their workforce and to protect uh, their patrons. And, and that's proven uh, quite successful. There have been uh, instances, instances of, of uh, uh, COVID transmitting uh, within staff, but not uh, at the, necessarily at the workplace, but at a, perhaps a social gathering after work or before work. 
Uh, and those are the issues that, that Dr. Henry has raised uh, with me. She's raised these publicly. We need to reduce the interactions we have with people that we don't know. And we need to make sure that we keep our, our bubble tight and that when we can't physically distance, we wear a mask, we continue to wash our hands, we continue to, to practice the very basic elements of public health that have been now become part and parcel of everyone's daily lives or the vast majority of British Columbians daily lives. And that's how we'll keep the transmission rate down. But it's, it's a result of social gatherings largely uh, and uh, that includes uh, some fitness classes that are intense and uh, in close quarters. Uh, Dr. Henry will have more to say about gyms and other uh, businesses uh, tomorrow as she finalizes uh, the orders that she'll be bringing forward then. But I, uh, I'm, I'm confident that uh, British Columbians get this and, and we need to, to bear down for the next couple of weeks uh, to make sure that we can stop this uh, spike in transmission uh, of, of COVID-19 and remind everybody that they're, you're not a lesser person if you contract COVID, it's a virus. Uh, but we need to take steps as individuals and as communities to protect ourselves and each other. And that's what we've been focused on for months now. And we need to continue reminding each other uh, that that's what's at stake here. Uh, 300 plus British Columbians are no longer with us as a result of COVID-19. That's an unacceptably high number and we wanna make sure that it doesn't get any higher. And that involves all of us working together, supporting each other during these extraordinary times. Do a follow up, Justine? Yes, thanks. So, so I'm just wondering what more your government needs to do if, if there is, uh, it's been eight days now since these regional um, restrictions were brought in. We haven't seen a, any sort of indication that it's, you know, cutting into the, or breaking the circuit, cutting into the number of cases that are rising. So do you need more regional strategies? Do you need more regional communication to try and get these messages through? Well, we are, you know, we're accelerating our communications. We need to find different ways to talk to uh, different demographics. Uh, you'll recall I reached out to uh, Deadpool and uh, Seth Rogen, uh, Michael Buble and others to talk to their networks using their platforms. Uh, there's been suggestions that we use some, uh, uh, some other mechanisms to break through with those uh, demographics that aren't watching uh, the daily briefings with uh, Bonnie and Adrian. They're not listening to me right now. They're not picking up the daily paper. They're not watching the evening news. We need to find always uh, strategies to embrace and engage with those people who are not hearing this message. And, and we're always looking at strategies, any suggestions. And I, I, I know that British Columbians wanna help here. And, and if there are suggestions, if there are individuals that are listening to me today that believe that they can use their platform to amplify the message uh, we want to hear from you. So uh, I'm on the internet. You can find me at uh, uh, horgansupremier.com or something like that. I'm sure you can find it. I'm not sure what the address is. But uh, we're always open to new suggestions and new ideas. And, and I believe that's uh, largely why we've been successful in British Columbia is that we can't have rigid regimes. People resist that. Uh, we need to make sure we're clear in our communications. I believe we are. We need to make sure we're reinforcing that message with other voices in the community. That's why uh, Dr. Henry and, and Minister Dixon and I have been speaking to faith leaders for months uh, so that they can amplify within their communities, within the synagogues and the gurdwaras and the churches of, and the mosques of British Columbia, talking to their parishioners and telling them what steps they can and should take to protect each other. Uh, talking to, uh, in school groups, talking to universities, talking to endless numbers of people, reinforcing that message that we are all in this together and the virus does not discriminate. It is a virus and we are all susceptible regardless of our status, regardless of our income, regardless of who we are, we can uh, contract the virus and then we can also then spread it to our loved ones and that's what we should be focused on. What can we as individuals do uh, to protect ourselves and those immediately around us? And if we continue to focus on that, we'll get through this, we'll get to Christmas, we'll get into the new year and when the viruses are, or when the vaccines are ready, British Columbia will be ready to distribute it. Thank you, everyone. That's all the time we have today. Thanks.